Well, we would like to welcome you to the Refugee TV podcast, and we are incredibly excited to share this space with you and to have you here with us. You are indeed an honored guest. I am your host, Dr. Will Gravely, and I have the esteemed honor and privilege of serving as lead pastor of Refuge Community Church, which is a people and lead strategist of the Community Hub, which is a place, and we could not be more grateful for you joining us here in this space and so give it up for yourselves. Um, we want to welcome you and we like to do that in a special way, right? So if you join us here in person at the hub where we gather together for worship every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. So we encourage you to come every single week. Yes, every single Sunday we are gathering at 11 a.m. And, and what we would do in person is encourage you to let us know whether you're more on the introverted side or the extroverted side so we can share God's love with you appropriately. We understand that we're not all wired the same when it comes to experiencing love, affection, and attention. And so what we like to do is to equip ourselves with a means of communication so that we don't end up loving people the wrong way, right? And so what we need to do then is to equip you. So if you're more on the extroverted side, we consider you a two, a two, that's right. So go ahead and put up the peace sign emoji, the digit two in the comments, whatever way you wanna let us know that you are a two and you would love to see your name mentioned in the comments. You would love to be flooded with virtual hugs, high fives, fist bumps, etc. You love to be in the limelight. Now there's others of you that are more on the other side of the spectrum. And so we consider you ones. If you're introverted, you are a one. So go ahead and put the one emoji, the digit one, any way you want to let us know that you're a one and you are happy to be here, but please don't show you any more affection or attention than you're already getting. Okay. And so we want to love on you the right way so let's go ahead and share god's love with each other right now go ahead and flood the comments let us know if you're a one or a two or somewhere in between so we can love on you the right way welcome welcome to the refugee tv podcast and so now at this time we would love to move forward with our gathering together. And we wanna let you know again that we are back to in-person gatherings. And so every Sunday we are gathering at the hub and we're experiencing the power of God. So we have this podcast format for our online guests. But when we're in person, we're experiencing the power of God. There's prophetic prayer. We have testimonies of a healing. Our goal in person is to cultivate an encounter with the Lord that is undeniable. And so we encourage you to come in person. If you're in the Atlanta metro area, if you're within driving distance, come on down to the hub and we would love for you to experience the safe space that we have created to experience God's love every day. So once again, that's every single week at 11 a.m. Now we have something special, something so special for you parents of little ones, especially if you're Little one is two to four years of age. Okay, so we have Sweet Peas Play, which is Atlanta's and really Georgia's premier soft play experience. Um, and they create a wonderland for your child. So we have partnered with them, two of our incredible refugees. They are an entrepreneurial couple. We have partnered with them right here at the hub to offer you um, this experience for your little ones ages two to four. And so we have a premier play day that is happening as we speak. 
the morning of the 13th, but moving forward, this will take place every first Sunday. So Sweet Peas Play Days will be every first Sunday right here at the Hub. So if you have little ones ages two to four, we encourage you, bring them on in. There is a wonderland and an incredible experience and environment created and cultivated just for them. Registration begins at 10.45 a.m. and will shut down at 11.15 a.m. So get here early. This is a first come, first served opportunity. So we love you so much and we encourage you to come on by and experience all that Sweet Peas has to offer. All right, so let's hear it for that. Now, coming up next, we want you to know that we are going to be celebrating communion today. We are going to be celebrating communion today. And so we understand. For those of you that are joining us here on the podcast, you are at home, you're at the office, you're somewhere else. So we encourage you right now, before we dive into today's message, before we go any further in our gathering time, go ahead and grab some elements. Now, what do we mean by elements? Jesus took unleavened bread and he took wine at the Last Supper because that's what they already had available. They were already drinking wine. It was a, a, a usual thing. It was protocol because wine was actually safer than the water supply back in ancient Palestine, right? And so they saw it as good for digestion. They warned people against getting drunk, but wine was a staple at every meal for first century Palestinian Jews, right? So that's what he had. They also had unleavened bread, and we're going to get into that in just a minute. But he let them know that this is symbolic, right? This is symbolic of my body. This is symbolic of my blood. So we encourage you, go ahead, grab something to drink and something to eat. Could be bread, could be crackers, could be something else. Whatever you have available. Um, Jesus used bread. Uh, he is the bread of life after all. But we encourage you, whatever you have available, go ahead and get something small to drink and something small that you can eat um, so that as we go through communion together, we have a shared meal. So we encourage you right now, just take a minute, go ahead and grab your elements, and uh, we would love to celebrate communion with you in just a few moments. And so if you're not aware, what's happening right here at the Hub is Brad Humphrey, our very own Community Groups Director, one half of the dynamic duo of Community Groups Directors that are Brad and Janae Humphrey. He is leading us through this series, The Final Four. And so we're on the second week's message. Last week, Brad taught us all about service and what it meant to have footwork. And he showed us this model of Jesus watching, washing the disciples' feet. And so we're going to continue in that series today, even as we unpack the final four plays of Jesus' playbook, and how we can unpack a winning strategy from these plays. And so week one was all about serving. And now we find ourselves at week two, where we are going to explore the play of supper. That's right, the last supper. It was a strategic move for Jesus. And so he taught us how to serve with the washing of the feet. And that was footwork in basketball terms. But today we're going to talk about supper or more specifically, not just the team, but the team meal. All right, so this is play number two, and we would love at this time to jump right on in. Let's jump right on in to play number two, the team dinner, how sharing a meal led to sharing a victory. So before we go any further, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this opportunity to be together. Thank you for this shared space, this online environment of Refugee TV. And even as we add more components, more shows, more episodes, we thank you for this time around your word. And so I just pray, Lord God, against any distraction, anything that we might have carried with us into this shared moment, this holy moment, this sacred space. May you help us to focus on you, that which matters most, and may we be transformed forever. So Lord God, my prayer is that you would speak through me and speak to me as we share this message together as your people. May we all hear and may we all be transformed. It is our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's give it up. Now, without any further ado, let's dive in to today's episode, episode five. And we're exploring play number two of the final four, team dinner, how sharing a meal led to sharing a victory. We're gonna be looking at Luke chapter 22, verses seven through 24. Luke 22, 7 through 24. I'll be reading from the ESV. Um, if you have another version, you can follow along. If you have the same version, feel free to read aloud with me. And so we're going to be jumping into Luke 22, 7 through 24, and it says this. Then came the day of unleavened bread. 
on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare the Passover for us, his disciples, that we may eat it. They said to him, where will you have us prepare it? And he, Jesus said to them, behold, when you've entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters and tell the master of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished, prepare it there. And they went and found it just as he had told them and they prepared the Passover. 14, and when the hour came, he reclined at table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. Pour a little bit for everybody. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. Yikes. For the son of man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to question one another, which of them it could be who was going to do this. A dispute also arose among them as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. Now, here we are right? The last supper, the Lord's supper. But I need you to understand that this was not something new that Jesus was instituting. He was not creating communion. No, as good Jews, right? They were celebrating the Passover. And so the Passover was a tradition that was passed down from generation to generation. And they, as faithful Hebrew people, were honoring this great feast. And so Jesus knew as a good Jew, he was going to embody the faith and he was encouraging his disciples to do the same. And so he sent out his disciples to find a place where they could share the Passover together. So let's unpack this thing as it unfolds. Then came the day of unleavened bread. Now this is the feast of unleavened bread. And you need to understand that this is a specific day on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed, right? So there's a seven day celebration, and this is a specific day where the lamb had to be sacrificed. And so as God honoring Jews, they needed a place to celebrate the Passover. This was not something they could miss. This was not an optional thing, right? This was to commemorate the salvific power of God. Now I need you to remember that. The Passover was to commemorate the salvific or the saving power of God. Let's continue. So Jesus sent Peter and John, two of his closest ones, saying, go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat it, right? So this is not just the space itself, but this is the lamb itself. Go and prepare Passover so that we can eat it, right? So it was the lamb, it was bitter herbs, and it was unleavened bread. But we'll, we'll talk more about that in just a few minutes. But this is the context of this text, okay? So that we may eat it. Verse 9. They said to him, where will you have us prepare it? And he said to them, behold, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Now, this is extremely prophetic. How would Jesus know that there would be a man there who is carrying a jug of water and he will meet the two disciples, Peter and John, and he is sending? Uh, some scholars agree that this is actually Nicodemus, the Pharisee that came to him at night and was asking about eternal life. And so Nicodemus wanting to secretly support the way, but also as, you know, a scholar or as a keeper or teacher of the law, uh, Nicodemus was also honoring those that were coming to celebrate Passover. And honestly, this was something that was a high feast. And so there were many Jews from across the diaspora that were coming into the holy city to celebrate such a feast. And so many scholars believe that this is actually Nicodemus, who is the one with the jar of water. But nonetheless, Jesus is giving a prophetic declaration to show that he is, in fact, not just holy, but also all 
knowing. And so he will meet you there. Follow him into the house that he enters and tell the master of the house. The teacher says to you, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room. So do you remember that there are many powerful and important things that take place in these upper rooms. Well, many houses had this upper room, and this was the place of fellowship. This was the place where you honored guests. This was the place where you took care of people, okay? So the upper room is not only the place where Holy Spirit comes and meets the disciples, but the upper room is also where the Lord's Supper or the team dinner takes place. And so understand again, Jesus did not create communion, but the Passover was something honored over generations to commemorate the salvific power of God. I'm going to unpack that in just a few moments, but let's continue unpacking this text. 12, and, and he will show you a large upper room furnished, prepare it there. And they went and found it just as he had told them and they prepared the Passover. And so they are preparing the Passover as God honoring Jews, which consists of a male lamb, one year old, and also unleavened bread and bitter herbs. This is the Passover. It's a tradition. It doesn't change. And this is an act of memory. It's an act of memory. What are they remembering? They are remembering when the spirit of death passed over the children of Israel in the land of Egypt, where God created and cultivated this salvific experience where the spirit of death, God's very spirit, it was so powerful and potent, right? Passed over the land of Egypt and all firstborn were struck dead, except for his people, those who are obedient, slaughtered the lamb, the choice lamb, and spread its blood over the doorpost and the lintel, which was the cross beam. Now we're going to unpack this, but I need you to understand what this means. This is a salvific picture. So the lamb the doorpost and the blood were the imagery of Jesus's crucifixion that was about to take place. This is the night that he is betrayed. And so this is such a revelatory picture for us. Communion is not a new creation of Jesus. Jesus used the Passover meal to show what the new covenant was about. Just as God was going to establish the old covenant with Moses, as Moses led his people out of slavery and bondage in Egypt, Jesus is the embodiment of the new covenant, but here's the parallel of the lamb that was slain to overcome death. Now, this is going to be a powerful picture, and we're going to unpack this together, but I need you to understand, Jesus did not create communion. He used communion to commemorate the new covenant. Now, 14, and when the hour came, now that's important, right? So, so what is this hour? Well, feasts and days were celebrated at sundown, even as they entered into the Sabbath, right? It was at sundown on Friday, okay? So sundown Friday to sundown Saturday is Shabbat. It's the Holy Sabbath. The Lord says to honor it forever and to keep it holy, okay? So not only are they honoring this tradition, but they are also honoring the hour at which the Passover meal was to be shared, okay? So when that hour came, he reclined at table and the apostles with him. It's a team dinner, right? And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Now, what is he trying to say? Listen, I'm the lamb that is to be slain. So I need to eat this meal with you because I want to honor my father in all ways. I have to live a life without blemish or without any ought or objection to it, right? And even though people try to bring charges against Jesus, he was found without error. So here he is as a God-fearing Jew, even as the embodiment of God, but he's honoring his father, right? Yahweh is proud of Yeshua, his son. His name literally means Yahweh's salvation. And here they are eating a meal commemorating Yahweh's salvation, even as Yahweh is about to save through Yeshua, Right, so what a powerful, potent picture here, even as they are celebrating Passover. Passover, let's give it up for the Lord and just his depth of teaching, even if he embodies the very metaphor of his lesson. 15, he said to them, I've earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. 16, for I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So why did he say it is fulfilled? Because the Passover is about to come to life. The Passover is about to be embodied as Jesus is the lamb. The cross at Calvary are the doorposts, the posts and the lintel, the cross beam. And 
the spirit of death is about to pass over all of God's people, not just chosen Israel, but even Gentile inclusion as generations of the body of Christ would grow and walk into this covenant, right? So I need you to understand. He said, I won't eat Passover again until this is literally fulfilled, right? And the kingdom of God experiences this in reality. So take a look at this. And he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. This is imagery as well. Uh, Peter was about to share in literally the same death, but he's telling his disciples, listen, you're not just following me into glory. You're following me into the crucifixion. You're not following me to a crown. You're following me to a cross. So I need you to understand that this cup that I drink from, that I'm about to pray, and we're going to get into this in play number three, but I'm about to pray it away to see if Yahweh, my father, can take this from me or if there's another way. The same cup has to be shared by you. You're not just following me into a crown. You're following me into a cross. So take this cup that's symbolic of my blood that's going to be shed, and you divide it amongst yourselves because you will be martyred as well. What an eerie foreshadowing at this last meal. Can you imagine this team dinner? It's a pretty somber and sober environment. Now, and he took the cup, and when he had given thanks... He said, take this and divide it amongst yourselves, 18. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine, that is wine, but also symbolic, until the kingdom of God comes. Jesus even tells us, I am the vine, you are the branches, you will bear much fruit. He's saying, listen, I will have no need of Passover. I am about to shed my real blood for this covenant and the kingdom of God will come. In all of its glory, I will be resurrected, right? So here he is at verse 19, and he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, why is he talking about remembrance? Because the Passover is a meal of remembrance. The children of Israel should never forget when the spirit of death, the very power of God himself, passed over the children of Israel who had the blood of the lamb on the posts and the lintel, the cross beam, and the spirit of death had no effect on them. Now, think about this. They had to acknowledge this sacrifice and act out this sacrifice perfectly. And then the spirit of death would pass over them. This is Jesus's life. Jesus is the lamb. And so he says, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. So he is bringing in this Lord's supper along with the historic memory, this act of the Passover to remember the salvific power of God. Brilliant, brilliant. And so he's saying, as often as you do this, even as you honor the Passover, but even as you're about to uh, understand what my passing actually means, I need you to do this in my memory. You are accustomed to doing the Passover in my memory. Now take this cup and this bread, and as often as you eat it, do so in my memory. What a powerful, powerful picture. And so in 20, and likewise the cup after he had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Yes, even as the blood of the lamb saves, the blood of the true lamb, that's myself, saves, Jesus is saying. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. Can you imagine a team meal where the one who's going to seemingly ruin it all, the one who seemingly is going to rob you of the championship is eating and sharing the meal with you? Now, here's what's powerful about that. We often see that as like Jesus' almost petty way or passive aggressive way of identifying Judas as the betrayer. But the way I see it, in addition to that, right, because that is accurate, is that Jesus is allowing Judas to partake in the new covenant. So what's the power in this? Knowing that the one who's going to betray him is participating in the team meal is to know that it is not God who robs us of the new covenant. It is ourselves who opts out. Judas could have been a part of the championship, but he quit the team. Judas could have been part of all of the glory that was coming, but he quit the team. Judas could have been saved and redeemed. Arguably, Peter's sin is worse. Peter was an apostate. He denied Jesus, and in doing so, the faith, the way. But he was restored to his post. And on that same revelation, the Lord established his church. Judas could have been restored. And let me tell you, it's never too late to repent. It's never too late to come back to the position that the Lord has placed you in. But you also got to realize that certain people in your life got to play a role. So you need to understand that Jesus was okay with this. But he didn't rob him of the new covenant. Judas robbed himself. Judas robbed himself. Now, 
Let's, let's wrap, up, wrap up this piece, then we'll go to the historical context. Uh, but behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table, and the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And he said this with some gusto. But they began to question one another which of them it could be who was going to do this. Now, here's what's weird about this argument, right? What's super weird about this argument. Um, Jesus is telling them, listen, like somebody over here is going to betray me. Like somebody over here is going to sell me out. Uh, but here's the problem. I'm telling you guys this, and you guys start to argue over who it is, but then somehow the argument goes from who's going to betray him to who's going to be the greatest. See how self-centered we can be? No, who's going to be next to you? Who's going to have a position of privilege? Who's going to be, you know, the man next to you? Jesus said, listen, one of y'all is going to betray me. And they began arguing about that, but then they stumbled their way into who's the greatest among them. You see how prideful we are? So check this out. It goes from arguing about who was going to do this to 24. A dispute arose among them as to which of them was going to be regarded as the greatest. And Jesus breaks down to them, listen, it's not for me to give to any of you who's going to sit at my right or my left, but the greatest among you needs to be the servant of all. So whether you're in corporate America, whether you are in an organization and sometimes there's a competition to make it up a rung of the ladder, I need you to understand there's always going to be somebody who's going to betray the principles and the covenants of the team. Uh, there's always going to be somebody who seems to spoil even a championship dinner or a championship moment. But nonetheless, it is not for you to necessarily uh, cast them away, but they will usually self-disqualify, right? So I need you to understand that. But we also need to be very careful about pride and how we usually leverage our proximity to God to garner a position for ourselves. This is what Judas is doing, and this is what the other disciples break out in an argument about. God is like, listen, I need you guys to understand. You're, 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 you're positioning yourselves based on your perceived proximity of me, but the very fact that you're arguing over it or even feel entitled to it says you still don't get what the kingdom of God is all about. So let's give it up for humility. Let's give it up for meekness. Let's give it up for self-confidence in knowing who we are and operating out of integrity and not in security. Let's give it up for the Lord there. Now, I want to point your attention to this historical context because they understand what the Passover is, but many of us may not. So I want to encourage you to take a look at what the Passover was, what it really meant, and what it means for us. So this is Exodus 12, 1 through 15. We'll do a quick read of it just to give you context of what they understand and what we need to understand in order to understand what Jesus is doing. Verse 1, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the midst of of Egypt. This month shall be for you the beginning of months. So Passover is so important, so critical that this is the beginning of measured time for the people of the book. And of course, Hebrews or Jews, as they're understood now, are keepers of the book, but they're also on a lunar calendar. We operate on a solar calendar instituted by Constantine, but this is a lunar calendar, right? So this is the first month this month of Passover. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household, one per household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, they don't have enough resources, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons. According to what each can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. So this is so important, so critical that the Lord is making sure everyone can participate. So if you and your family can't afford it, go to your nearest neighbor and you guys shall eat together according to how much you all will consume. That's how important this is. Verse five, your lamb shall be without blemish, a male a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. So understand that what they considered a lamb was either a sheep or the goats. And oftentimes, sheep and goats would be together. The only way you could distinguish them was by their behavior. Yes, the sheep and the goats dwelled together. They grazed together. They all often moved together as flocks. But you could tell the difference between a sheep and a goat because one was hard-headed and prideful and stubborn, and the other was meek. The other followed, and the other was submitted. All right? God doesn't waste anything. 
but in this case you can take it from the sheep or the goats and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month so it's four days later right when the whole assembly of the congregation of israel shall kill their lambs at twilight see what jesus meant by the hour had come so you are to kill your lamb at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts, that's the side pieces, and the lintel. So the lintel is the cross beam and the doorposts are the side pieces. So look at the metaphor here. The post and the lintel is what we can understand as the cross. God doesn't waste anything, anything at all. And the lintel of the houses in which they eat it, verse 8, they shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. So Jesus knew that the Passover included unleavened bread, and that is what he took, which is what we still do to this day. Yes, those are those flat styrofoam loafers you got at that old school Baptist church, or it is the lush flat bread that you have partaken of in different environments. But nonetheless, I need you to understand that this unleavened bread is a part of Passover, and that's what was present for Jesus to institute communion or the common union of the disciples, right? Verse nine, do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted its head with its legs and its inner parts. So don't fool with it, roast the whole thing. And you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning, you shall burn. So it was to be consumed, meaning there's no part of this covenant that should be wasted. There's no part of this celebration that is not going to be utilized. None of this is for fanfare. It's for nourishment and remembrance, right? So even as Jesus dies as the Holy Lamb, none of it is supposed to be wasted. None of this is for fanfare. None of this is for show. I want it to be consumed. So let me ask you, what part of the covenant is just left on the table what part of god's covenant with you is still on the plate jesus is saying consume it because whatever is left until morning is going to be burned up don't waste what the lord has so freely given to you you're not too far from god the lord has established a covenant with you if he could sit at the table and share his covenant with judas then the lord can also share his covenant with you and i let's give it up for god's graciousness and mercy now it's with the bitter herbs, and he's talking about how it needs to be prepared. It's to be roasted and how it's going to be consumed. There's no leftovers. It's going to be burned in the morning. Verse 11, in this manner you shall eat it with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. So this is so interesting. God's like, listen, I need you to be ready to move. So, so here's the deal, right? We're not supposed to get saved and then take our seat. We're not supposed to take our salvation and then take our seat. We're supposed to be ready to move. So how many of us get saved, we're on fire, and then we sit down somewhere waiting to be told what to do? No. The Lord your God has saved you to move. This is a movement of the children of Israel. We're about to be freed. And so it's not just what you're freed from, friends. It's what you're freed for. And so I need you to understand, let's give it up for God for that. It's not what you're freed from. It's what you're freed for. And so he wasn't just freeing them from the bondage of Egypt. He was releasing them into their journey to the promised land, but they had to be ready. So let me ask you, are you dressed to move? Are you ready to move? When God has freed you, when God has spared you, are you ready to move on to what the Lord has for you? I know you are, and I pray that you will do just that. So be ready. That's the metaphor here in the sandals, in the belt, and in the staff. And you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. This is the Lord's Passover. It's not ours. It's not our meal. It is the Lord's doing. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night. This is, this is the power of God. For the Lord is terrible and our powerful. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It is God's very spirit that struck down the firstborn. Ooh. Can you imagine? This is the power of God. His presence struck down. God was the last plague. Can you imagine the power of God brought the other plagues, the locusts, the frogs, etc.? But can you imagine that God himself was the last plague? Listen, you don't have to do anything to your enemies. If the Lord's presence is with you, stuff's going to happen. So I just need you to be in position. You slaughter the right lamb without blemish. You spread the blood on the doorpost. Receive the Lord's salvation. You recognize who you are in the Lord and be ready to move when God says so. God will take care of your enemies. So I need you to understand that. The Lord is just and the Lord is also merciful. So don't be mad if he shows your enemies mercy, but the Lord can handle your enemies. This is the spirit of God himself that is passing over as the last plague. How powerful is that? 
And so this is the Lord's Passover, and the Lord is saying, I will pass over the land of Egypt. And then he says, both man and beast will be stricken down. I will strike down the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. Can you imagine anything that sets itself up as an idol against God? Anything, including us, that wants to be worshipped or adored or be seen in a certain position or we're posturing for certain privilege? The Lord is unmatched. And so the, the Lord will strike down idols. And so he says, listen, I'm not just taking out the the firstborn, that's both humans and animals. God's not playing. He also says, and I will exact this on all the gods of Egypt. I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Woo, let's give it up for God. The Lord is nothing and no one to be played with. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Say that, type it in. I will pass over you. That's the pass over. I will pass over you. So the spirit of the Lord, who's bringing death, passed over the children of Israel who had the blood on the posts, right? Do you see the salvific imagery? So here's Jesus saying, I am the lamb. The cross is the post. My blood is this blood. And the spirit of God, the judgment on all other gods, the judgment on those born into iniquity, it will pass over you in this new covenant. True. Let's give it up for the Lord. Now, let's wrap this up. This day shall be for you a memorial day. A memorial day. Well, let me, let me give you the rest of this promise here in 13. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So this is the Lord moving over Egypt. But he says, no plague will befall you. 14, this day shall be for you a memorial day. Notice Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. So the Passover is a memorial and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations as a statute forever. Somebody type in forever as a statute forever. Type in for ever. Now you shall keep it as a feast. Seven days shall you you eat unleavened bread on the first day you shall remove leaven out of your houses. Now what is leaven symbolic of pride? pride. So just in case you think you saved yourself, just in case you think you were good enough for the spirit of death to pass over, just in case you think that there's some privilege in your position, I want you to remember, I need you to get all leaven out of your house. What does that mean? Get all pride out of your heart. Get all entitlement out of your heart. Get all you owe me or I ought to have by now out of your heart. And remember, it is the Lord who reigns and rules. It is the Lord's doing. It is the Lord who blesses. It is the Lord who brings curses i need you to understand that so reverence the lord and remember who you are get all that leaven out of your house i need you to type that in get the leaven out of your house aka get the pride out of your heart you give it up for humility let's give it up for humility all right now i need you to get it out of your house for if anyone eats what is leaven from the first day until the seventh day that person shall be cut off from israel that person shall be cut off from Israel. See, even the imagery of what the Lord, Yahweh, is setting up to come through his son, Yeshua, right? You'll be cut off if there's any pride in you. If you denounce this, if you deny the sacredness of the lamb, the blood, the covenant, death will not pass over you. You'll be cut off from Israel. But you who are included in this covenant, you'll be brought into Israel. Even as a Gentile, you'll be included into this covenant. If you drink of this cup and you eat of this bread my body my blood this new covenant for jesus yeshua is the lamb who was slain do you see all this deep imagery we miss communion is not a new institution of the western church communion is the lord taking the memorial covenant of the passover and showing everyone that he is actually the lamb that is to be slain let's give it up for that revelation thank you lord thank you lord now i'm going to give you just two quick takeaways two quick takeaways it says, communion was an old concept for a new covenant. Communion was an old concept for a new covenant. Jesus is celebrating the Passover with his disciples, but he gives new imagery and understanding to that unleavened bread and to that lamb, i.e. the blood that he will shed and the body of his that will be broken. The perfect lamb, just as was sacrificed in Passover, the perfect lamb, Yeshua, was going to be sacrificed for his friends. So communion is an old concept for a new covenant. And secondly, 
Never forget the purpose of unity. Communion is our common unity and the power of memory. Jesus says, as often as you do this, do so in my memory. And so if you have your elements with you at this time, we would love to celebrate Holy Communion with you. But even before we go further into this Holy Supper, this meal of memory, I want to offer you the opportunity because communion is for believers. Even as the Passover was for Jews, communion is for believers. All of us who have entered into the new covenant, we are to eat this in memory of Jesus until he returns. But I want to give you the opportunity. If you recognize that you are born into sin, if you recognize that you are in bondage, even as the people of Israel were in bondage in Egypt, we cannot free ourselves from sin. We cannot free ourselves from the desire to break God's statutes, from our inability to hit the mark, God's standard. And so Yeshua is the lamb that was slain. What a clear picture. And we need to receive this lamb in order for all that sin and death brings to pass over us. So Jesus, Yeshua, is the lamb that was slain. His blood establishes the new covenant. His body is broken for us and his salvation is for you. And so I would love to pray for you right now. I pray that Holy Spirit gives you the words to pray your own prayer of confession, confessing your sin and also communicating your commitment to follow Yeshua for the rest of your days and to enter into this new covenant that he establishes. We recognize Lord God that we are all Judas to you. And so we come to you broken and we repent. We don't rob ourselves of this salvific opportunity. And so we receive your salvation, Lord. And we thank you for your sacrifice, that you are the perfect lamb that was slain. Your blood is spread not only over the cross, but over our lives. And no plague will befall us, Lord God. And also the spirit of death will pass over us, Lord God. So we thank you for new life in you. We have died to our old selves and we are raised to new life in you. And so we thank you for this, the new covenant established in Yeshua, the lamb that was slain. And so we thank you for your blood and for your new life and in this new covenant. And so I thank you, Lord God, for all those who are coming into life out of death and those that can celebrate this holy meal of memory in Jesus name. Amen. And so I would love for you to grab your elements, whatever you have. um, And let's take communion together. So Jesus on the night that he was betrayed, he had a meal with his friends, the Passover meal to be specific. And after that meal, he took bread. And after this bread was offered, it was blessed, and then he broke it. You're probably having a much easier time than I with your elements, but I want you to go ahead and prepare them the best you can. And just give me a moment here as I crack open this first century Palestinian packaging, okay? So here's the deal. I might have to be real symbolic with y'all in a second if I can't get this baby open, but uh, you just go ahead and there we go. Praise the Lord. You just go ahead and uh, take this moment to remember what Jesus has done for us all. Take this moment to remember what Jesus has done for us all. And so what did he do? (laughs) Praise God. He took bread and after giving thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is willingly broken for you for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you eat this, just like the Passover, do so in my memory from coming back. Let us take and eat this together. Thank you, Yeshua. You are the perfect lamb that was slain. And likewise, he lifted up the cup and he said, this is my cup of the new covenant. It's symbolic of my blood that will be shed for you, but this establishes the new covenant. So just as the Passover lamb was slaughtered and the blood was spread on the post, my blood was shed for you on the cross, the post and the lintel. And as often as you drink this, you do so in my memory, even as you eat the Passover meal to remember God's salvific power. As often as you eat this, you remember my salvific power. And then I'm coming back for you as my body. Let us drink this together. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We celebrate your power. We celebrate your majesty, Yeshua. We celebrate you as the lamb who was slain. And so we thank you so much for this meal of memory, this team dinner, where we can remember our betrayal of you.
even our denial of you, but also your sacrifice for us in this new covenant, which is shared with us. And so we thank you for your saving grace. And this is in Yeshua's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. So, so grateful for that. And now I just have a few things to make you aware of. Please don't forget, every first Sunday, we have Sweet Peas play. And so we are so excited to offer this dynamic environment to you. And so remember, registration begins in person at 1045 a.m. on the first Sunday of the month. So we cannot wait to share that experience with you. Likewise, we have baptism coming up. That's right. So if you want to take your next step in faith and what that means is you are already committed to following Jesus or you have recommitted recently well your next step is water baptism and this is symbolic of your death and going down with Jesus as he was buried dying to your old ways and being resurrected that's being lifted out of the water and living in new life as who you are now in Christ. And so we would love to honor that with you and to celebrate that with you. And so we are having in-person baptism March 20th and also April 17th. So March 20th, April 17th, and you can register online right at our website, refugeatl.com. And please go to our website, save it in your favorites, uh, make it a quick button or a quick link for yourself because that is gonna be the central place to know all that is going on with refugees, that's our faith family, and what's going on at the hub. So refugeatl.com is the hub for all things happening at the hub, okay? So go ahead and lock that in, but you can also register for baptism online. We cannot wait to celebrate that with you. So please go ahead, check out our website. We have done some updates and we are continuing to do even more, and so we are so Excited for you to see uh, what's up on our website and to enjoy that environment with us. Well, friends, I'm Dr. Will Gravely. We are so grateful that you joined us here at the Refugee TV podcast, and we want to send you off the way we do every single week. So go ahead, type this in, shout it loud, make your neighbors nervous, make your coworkers uncomfortable, wherever you may be. Say this, Jesus loves you. Jesus is with you. Now let's go and change the world. We love you so much, and we cannot wait to see you and serve you soon right here at the Community Hub. Peace.